everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Top Producing Zone podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Michael Jinn. And I'm Shane Carvalho. And Shane and I are thrilled to have with us this week Brian Ellington, new Chief Learning Officer for eXp Realty. So Brian is an award-winning business development and operations leader. He's been incredibly successful at driving growth, creating new streams of revenue for businesses, and he has been a thought leader in developing training and coaching programs for multiple large real estate companies such as KW, Century 21, Realogy, and we are super excited to have him now with us at eXp Realty. So Brian, with that, welcome to the podcast. We are so happy to have you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that kind of introduction. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, I mean, you you recently started at DXP, becoming the, the chief learning officer. You obviously have an extensive background in business development, learning development, operations. Uh, what drew you to this new adventure with DXP? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so interestingly enough, I actually have worked with most of our leadership team uh, in the past. So I worked with uh, Michael Valdez when I was at Realogy. I worked with Leo when I was at KW and also at Realogy. And then interestingly enough, I, I've known Glenn since 2004. Um, I, uh, I was actually uh, creating a, a program. I was going to write the definitive works on lead generation in our space, um, along with the, the founder of a company I was with at the time. Uh, and uh, along the way, this was 2004 timeframe in our, our industry, as you know, is a little slow in adopting technology. I started meeting all these great agents who were doing their, yeah, just a little bit. Uh, I started meeting all these fantastic agents who were doing their lead generation through the internet, which at the time that was, you know, the internet was where agents would paste their glamour shots onto their website and that was it, right? And, uh, <laughs> and one of these crazy characters that I met was this guy, Glenn Sanford, out of like Bellingham, Washington. Who's ever heard of that, right? And, uh, and he had this tremendous system called Buyer Tours. And so I ended up uh, studying and modeling his business. We got to know one another. And so uh, when, I, when I left Realogy and, and I had a, a non-compete for a time period, I started up my coaching uh, business and uh, I started conversations with Michael and Leo and Glenn. Uh, and the second my non-compete was up, they said, come on over. The water's fine. And I did. Isn't that, isn't that so funny, though? Like how often like opportunities come up when you have a great network of people that you work with that you kind of keep in touch with. And I think that's incredibly important. It sounds like that's kind of been important for you. And it's it's something we talk about in the podcast as well, like just leveraging your network for like opportunities in the real estate space for your clients, for deals. Yeah. And, and the right opportunity too. I mean, yeah. you know, there, there are a few uh, paths I could have taken um, working with this leadership team under this model with the XP. Um, it, it gave me kind of the best of all worlds, working with cool people that I like, um, having a huge impact, much bigger than, uh, you know, I as an individual might have had on my own, being able to step into an organization that's already 90,000 and growing, and then just an amazing model to, to be a part <clears throat> of. Yeah, just great opportunity. Well, I mean, I was going to ask, Brian, I mean, you've, because you've held like this, you know, wide range of positions with the different brokerages. I mean, you've obviously seen a lot of realtors and been involved in a lot of realtor development. What are like some common themes that you've seen with, you know, agents that are going to be successful and agents that are unsuccessful? I'd say the first thing is start with the right model. Be in an organization that that is agent centric. And at eXp, I almost think we we take that for granted. I've been a part of a lot of organizations that do not think that way. Um, they are very much franchise organizations oriented toward the franchisee who is their customer. So I'd say start with an organization that really values the agent and puts them first and, and not just in rhetoric, but in action as well. Right. Um, the for you as an agent, though, um, making sure that you're successful. So the things that I see from uh, the most successful agents really are consistency. There's this this sort of mythology that, you know, these top agents are uh, exceptionally social, exceptionally brilliant. And while they are smart and while they are, you know, uh, people who can who can be persuasive in conversations, it, that's not what made them so successful. What what made them so successful, in my experience, is the consistency at what I often kind of think about as the treadmill. Right. Every business has a discipline. And in our business, that discipline is pretty straightforward. The, the question is, how consistent can you be in doing that? 
because if you can be consistent, you're going to be successful. The um, other thing is, uh, you know, you're, you're talking to a guy who wrote uh, a training program called Your Business is Your Database, right? Um, it can, it, without exception, every top agent I've ever talked to has expressed one regret about their business, and that is they didn't build their database bigger sooner. Um, because mm -hmm. everybody who's gotten to that level of success has come to realize that is is the thing that is going to sustain your business year in year out. Doesn't matter what the market's doing. Um, that was that was me. I was like, that's me. Yeah. I you know I've been in the business since 1999, and uh, it took until 2016. 17 to actually finally build a database. So think about that. I went, I went eight, almost 18 years, you know, without building the database also without branding. I didn't brand until 2018. Yeah. You know, you've worked at these franchises, right? Where we all have the same boilerplate, like glamor shop, little website and where with some companies, they even share the social media posts so that, you know, you and 20 of your colleagues will put the same thing. So you're going on the Instagram feed and it's like same post four times in a row. It's like, so those were two things, but yeah, I didn't want to cut you short, but it just, I'm laughing because I'm like, Oh my God, that's me with the whole database. It's surprising. I've been so successful with not, yeah, it, you know, implementing that. Center. And that's key to any business. You know, I, I started uh, a worldwide uh, franchising division uh, with a friend of mine at a company we were at at the time. And the first thing I did when I stepped into that role was build a database. Um, you know, whether you're selling homes or you're selling franchises or you're selling cars, I mean, even you go to, to a car dealership, they're putting you in a database and you're going to get a call from that car salesperson or any sort of sales environment. That is the name of the game. So um, the other thing, too, is most of us in this industry and, and my mom was this. Right. And by the way, my mom's database was a, a 3M spiral notebook with little stickies hanging off the side is green. <laughs> that thing sat on her front seat in between the driver and the passenger seat for decades, man. She was a, a realtor for 30 years. Um, but, but my mom also followed that traditional route of <clears throat> uh, working with buyers until they start selling homes. Right. And for a lot of us, that means the first few years in this business are rough. Our schedule is not our own. Um, we're a taxi cab more often than not. And so um, what I see with top agents is they figure out a way to shortcut that. In other words, get into listings sooner. Don't mean to disparage buyers at all. That is, a, you know, should be a solid 50 percent of your business. But figuring out a way to shortcut that process and getting into listings sooner. In other words, not just relying upon your your buyers and your sphere to convert over time, but actively going after listings. That's what differentiates the most successful agents. And then the the last thing, this is sort of a weird concept, but complementary lead generation sources. Um, mm -hmm. And what I mean is. So the, the, the two things that I see agents doing, especially in early days in their careers, that, that holds them back is uh, they're not consistent enough in a lead generation strategy. Like they'll try, a, um, you know, farming a geographic farm for 90 days. That's not how you work a geographic farm. Um, yeah. and, and then the other thing is that they'll, they'll do things that are so disparate from one another. They'll do Facebook advertising over here for, for one group of people, and then maybe they'll do uh, open houses over here, but then they'll do cold calling over there. And if you think about it like this, um, let's just take open houses, for example. Right. So if you're going to do an open house, why aren't you circle prospecting around it? And um, and if you're going to do uh, an open house, why aren't you doing that in a farm? Whether it's your open house or not, it doesn't matter. Why aren't you doing that in the farm that you're that you're mailing to or, or whatever other efforts you have going on? Making sure that your lead generation efforts are, are tied in. If you are a farmer, for example, making sure that your next geographic farm that you add in is either a move up or a move down community related to the, the farm that you're already tackling unless there's a really good reason to just go to a, to a different <clears throat> geographic farm meaning you're moving up in luxury price point or something like that as much as possible lining up your dominoes so that they fall in tandem with one another and, and it's not just this weird effort of spinning this plate and then spinning this plate separately 
I think that's what separates most successful agents from the non-successful agents. And, you know, if you want to be non-successful in this business, unsuccessful, just do the exact opposite of everything I just said. And, and that'll <laughs> differentiate you there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we do, and we do see that with a lot of like newer agents. I feel like, especially in this day and age, there's a lot of there's a lot of what I would call like shiny object syndrome, <laughs> and I think that gets into the lack of like complementary spaces and, and tools and resources that you can use to like the prospect because they'll go from like they'll they'll go on YouTube right or they'll they'll listen to a mastermind and it's like. Oh, Facebook ads. That's the thing. Let me try that. Or, oh, this is, here's another thing. Let me try that. And they don't ever think they, well, one, they don't commit to it because they do it for like 30 days and they're like, oh, well, this was supposed to get me, you know, the, the, the results that I see you, you person on YouTube getting. Yeah. And so I didn't get that. So that must mean it's not successful. So let me try something else. Yes. Um, and that's, I feel like it's such a huge challenge with like agents these days. Yeah. Well, especially, in, especially in this market too, with, you know, less, there's less transactional volume and then, you know, people that are listening to the media, you know, a lot of less experienced agents that are not as busy. Well, I mean, there's even experienced agents that are not as busy, but I'm saying, I think now more than ever, people are kind of grasping for that secret edge, you know? And yeah. so the, we see the shiny object thing happen a lot. Yeah. You got to let the hockey stick curve hit. Um, and that, that is what happens, you know, it, it, it is, um, in our business, it is a farming mentality. Um, and you know, you can have a hunter's mentality if you're going after FISBOs and expires and things like that. Um, but even that's going to take a little bit of skill and practice yeah. in order to get good at it. But mostly generation efforts within our industry are going to have a hockey stick effect. You got to let that hockey stick take place. And, and you got to more than just hear somebody up on stage say, I did it this way, and then just go try to implement that. Whatever you're doing, take a, a learner's approach to it, man. I don't know what, what hobbies or, or crafts or sports or anything like that that you guys might have. Um, maybe it's podcasting, by the way. Um, but for me, whenever I'm learning something new and I'm constantly trying to learn something new, I, I'm watching tons and tons of YouTubes on it. I'm reading books on it. I'm just ingesting any sort of information I can find about that thing as much as possible. And I'm trying to immerse myself in it. That said, don't don't have the Jamie Foxx effect. I don't know if you guys remember the movie Collateral with uh, with Tom Cruise, Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx is this cab driver and he's he's got this dream that he's going to have island limousines. Right. And it's going to be this cool thing. And, and Tom Cruise's character is kind of chiding him and he says, well, why haven't you done it? And, and Jamie Foxx is like, well, it's got to be perfect, man. It's got to be perfect. No, it doesn't have to be. Get in, get messy. But but do refine over time, right? Make sure that you're learning from the best over time. Well, it's funny. It's funny you say that because like when you're talking about hobbies or just interests, like two things come up. I mean, one, one really is this podcast, right? Like it's funny, Shane and I, I mean, we've been business partners for what, going on three years now. I think we talked about getting on video in year one. <laughs> um, and, and you don't know much about my background, Brian, but I, I, I come from an engineering background. Mm -hmm. And so there is very much that like, perfectionist like nature about me yeah. so at, like what you said was like spot on it literally took me three years up until like well now we're in a new year but the beginning of last year to get on camera and get on video and start this podcast because a lot of it was oh shit i gotta i'm gonna start the swearing train but like, i was like <laughs> okay, like i i have to be perfect with the video and literally on a saturday morning i'd be trying to record something and I'd be recording for like 10 hours and it'd be like one video and I couldn't even get one freaking video done. Um, and really what changed for me was getting over that hump of like, it, it's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Let's go out and do it. Yeah. And Shane always jokes with me. Like now I'm like an engineer with, with uh, what do you call it, Shane? With a character? With a personality. With a personality. He doesn't, <laughs> Brian doesn't believe you right now. Brian does not believe you're an engineer right now. Yeah. So, you know what's funny, Brian? Like, and for me, I'm a people person, not shy at all. I couldn't be on video either. Um, and for me, it's about being a perfectionist, right? And so the perfectionist thing you're talking about is what held me off forever. Honestly, it took going through cancer to finally come back and say, oh, my God, there's so many more important things in life, like living. Like, who cares if I'll be on camera? You just went through, like, massive, like, life-saving surgery, and you're worried about being on video. So we, you know, we came back and got this going. Um, I had surgery in September of 22 now. So, like, oh, it's been, like, a year and, like, four months or so. And honestly, not that it should take anybody like major life changing events to like push them there, but it took till that to finally 
be willing to be. Because the thing is, like, even watching Michael when he sent me his first videos, same thing happens to me. Like, we could talk like this all day long. I could be on stage at EXP. I could be at one of the big events in front of 10,000 people. It doesn't even phase me. But the moment I put a camera or a phone up like this, I'm, I'm done. Like, this guy, he tenses up like he's about to get hit by a car or something. It's, it's crazy. Now, both of us are so much more comfortable. And um, so, it's yeah, well, you, it's, it's funny you say that. You know, it's interesting about that, two things, is um, go, go back and look at Gary V's first videos. If you don't know who Gary Vee is, he's a he's a very oh yeah online social influencer. Started I've him. seen him. He's so awkward. Yeah, his first videos, he was very awkward, and it was, but he he got good because he practiced. Right, this is George Leonard and the concept of mastery. It's time on task over time, and and anything that you do with consistency and purpose, you're going to get better at. And if your expectations are being great at it at first. It's sorry, that's just not how life works. And, and certainly being on video and podcasting and, and doing YouTubes is no different. Um, the, the other thing too, and this is for those of you who are, who are doing videos, you know, I've, I've trained faculty uh, trainers in the real estate space for a couple of decades. Um, and, and one of the things I'll often share with them, a lot of people get stage fright and nervousness. Um, what I share with them is that you're the one who's most concerned with how you appear. They're not. Mm -hmm. They're concerned about the quality of information. Think about where you get your information from. Are those the sexiest people alive? Are those the people with the, the best head of hair or, you know what I mean? Um, no, right. they're, they're, often, they're often not really very attractive people when you think about it, but that's not why you're tuning in. Um, you're tuning in to get your information, whatever that information is. Um, and so focus more on the quality of information and man, that that's what people will will come back. I'm just, now I'm thinking about all everybody I've listened to. <laughs> what you're saying, I'm trying to analyze if that's the case. That's funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, not to change course too much, but you know, let's say for instance, you have you have a superpower, right? So mm. um, you can turn any challenge into an opportunity for success. So you know, you've had a lot of success, and obviously, you've worked you know in a lot of different places. You know, what was like one memorable challenge, you know, you could share that you've turned into success and um, and how did you tackle it? Um, so uh, I'll talk about um, a particular competitor I worked for in my past. Uh, this was during the, the Great Recession. And um, what's interesting is that was a franchise company and a lot of our franchisees had gotten themselves into hot water with their with their leases. They had they had bet on the come and the come didn't come. Um, and they built these, <laughs> these Taj Mahal offices and all of a sudden they were upside down in their leases. And at the time, that company that I was with didn't have a commercial division so much so that I actually had to go uh, as chief products officer at the time. I had to go and partner with a tenant rep specialist commercial company. Had an interesting conversation with them one day where we were talking about the timing of the market. Remember, this is 2008, 2009 timeframe. What was going on in residential was not yet going on in commercial. But I, I realized that was about to go down in commercial mm -hmm. through that conversation. And, and what occurred to me was that was going to be a very disruptive moment for a company that could come into the commercial space and disrupt that model. And if we could use our model, which was a cap model at the time, which was not something that was really done in commercial real estate at the time, that could be very disruptive. And in fact, at the time when we launched it, uh, we were the fastest going commercial company um, ever that I ever heard of. A uh, thousand folks in one year, or actually less than one year. Um, and so the, the kind of lesson that I took away from that was... Uh, and then also, too, in that same time period, I was I started working with a lot of REO and short sale folks um, and and actually put together a mastermind in that company for uh, REO and short sale agents to, to build up that. Um, there was a lot of opportunity uh, in that space here. Here's something that was interesting. Um, I uh, actually pulled this for you guys. Um, OK. This is per person productivity. When I say PPP, it's per person productivity. Um, in in uh, the early 2000s, uh, per person productivity was around uh, 5.6. 2005 was about 5.6. Um, you know what happened come around 2007? 
It had gone down, dipped below four. The reason being is uh, there was this old joke that uh, in California, a highway patrol officer pulls over a person and says, hey, uh, uh, registration and your real estate license. And the person says, well, don't you mean my driver's license? And he goes, well, oh, OK, well, if you got that, I'll take it. But not everybody has one of those. <laughs> Um, everybody got into the industry. Yeah, a lame joke, but, but everybody got into the industry yeah. at that time, right? And, and membership in R swelled, so per person productivity yep. went down like below four. And and so what happens come 2010? Well, it starts going back up again because everybody started exiting the industry. What do you think's happened over the past few years? 2021 per person productivity 3.92, 2022 3.18. What do you think is about to happen in our industry? Right? It, it is a, a timing um, based thing. And, and this is going to be a huge opportunity for us. But, but just looking at it the right way, <clears throat> making sure you understand that, unfortunately, of the 1.55 million realtors that we have today, not everybody's going to make it out of this year. And, and um, that sucks for those individuals, for those of us who plan to stay in this business and, and make a, a living and be professionals about it, though. That's a huge opportunity. We're about to have more per person productivity in this in this industry than we've had in the past few years. And that's a great opportunity. Well, now I, I, I want to dig into that a little bit, Brian, because <clears throat> I mean, you obviously have a lot of experience going to different companies, different businesses, evaluate like coming in, evaluating kind of where everything is before you kind of decide, okay, like, how do I go about driving more business growth? How do I drive more revenue stream? And so I'm kind of curious, like, put that hat on, um, a look at kind of where we are with the current real estate market landscape. Um, you as an agent, like, what would you go about assessing? How would you go about approaching it to kind of stay in this market with, as we know, like a lot of agents dropping out right now? Yeah. I mean, there's, um, what, there, there's no shiny object here. Um, right. This is this is fundamentals 101. This is a skill based market, by the way. And with some of these recent court rulings uh, and, and court cases, um, that that's going to mean that we're going to really have to focus on the listing side of the business to really control yeah. our future. Um, but this is the the basics, and, and this is such a simplistic business. It really is simple, not easy. But very simplistic. I mean, the, the basic essentials of our business is this. Contact the people that you know. Add to them by contacting people that you don't know and who are most likely to need you. Right. Focus on those, the people that you don't know. Focus on the ones who are most likely to need you. And while you're looking for the people who are ready, willing and able to, to buy or sell now, that's what you hope for. That's not the focus. Right. The focus is building that that list of people that, you know, in such a way that, you know, enough of those people, the percentages will work to where it fills your pipeline, that they're ready, willing and able at any given time. You know, not everybody that you meet is going to be ready, willing and able right away. But but if you plan to be in this business and be successful for the long term, it is really just that simple. Contacting a certain number of people per day that you know, and a certain people, uh, uh, people, a certain number of people per day that you don't know and, and going from there. And, and it's formulate literally I I've created like Excel spreadsheets that you tell me how much money you want to make through conversion rates. And I studied 850,000 transactions at a, in a former life and looked at the fall through rates from closed deals to, you know, contracts to appointments and, and things of that nature. Um, it is formulaic in terms of the numbers you put in up here will dictate how many contacts per day and how many appointments per week. And as long as you set that as your discipline, that, that treadmill, right. Um, and, and figure out your way. The, the fun thing about our business is what I just shared with you, that that's very, um, that's very up in the air as to how you go about making those contacts. I'll share a story. I did this um, this contest in a former life where we had thirty plus teams of six people yeah. each. So they were usually these top agent teams, and they called out six people from their team to go compete yeah. against one another in this month long kind of experiment. And we called it okay. the six thousand. <clears throat> and the whole goal was for each team 
to do 6,000 contacts in a one month period. Six people, that's a thousand each, do the math, that's 250 contacts per week. Right now, for a lot of agents, they'll hear that and go, oh, my God, how do you do six? And by the way, these were new contacts, new contacts. Okay. How do you go meet 250 people a week? <laughs> we had people go to like sporting events and stand at the concession stand. Hi, Brian Ellington, EXP Realty. How are you? And we had people going to uh, like uh, <laughs> Barnes and Noble standing by the magazine rack <laughs> introduced. <laughs> However you choose to do it. I, I know Levi is in Dallas. He's EXP. Um, amazing at YouTube. So much so one of uh, the folks that he put through his, his training course, Sue and Kim, did 140 transactions, I think, in less than two years off of YouTube. Just YouTube, right? However you choose to do it, get yourself out there, make those contacts. And, and again, some combination of the people you know and adding to that group with people that you don't know, you're going to be successful. It, it is really straightforward. Other than that, then just refinement of the discipline. Again, studying the people who are succeeding. My favorite quote from Picasso is, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Go out there and figure out what the top people are doing and own that. Make it your own in some way or another. I agree. I agree with what you're saying. I agree about how it's simple, right? And so like in our mastermind last night, you know, I was talking about how I'm excited about this year because I mean, this is my 24th year. So it's like, you know, I've seen a lot of year beginnings and you just have a sense of how it's going to be. So I mean, not always because we don't have a crystal ball, but like, you know, it was interesting. I was looking back at something I put up on Instagram back in July. And, you know, not that I can predict, but just based on the factors of what was going on, my predictions about what the market was doing were like spot on, which I'm, you know, I'm stoked about. If we've gone the other way, well, yeah, I'm not saying I could see the future, but, uh, but yeah, I, what I was going to share with, I shared with them and kind of what you were talking about too, is what activity is going to get you there. So we were revisiting goals because we, I did a goals thing last month. Want to revisit, make sure everybody has their goals tightened up. And so yeah. reverse engineering, like what you're saying, like what activities and how many, does it take like how many calls does it take to get to one lead to get to one transaction and one thing that i wanted to reiterate because we've all been bringing up the whole shiny object thing is i try to tell them that hey if you want to try something new at least have one baseline that's the highest conversion and for me i'm really big on the sphere over 90 percent of my business is my sphere my database and so i'd say pick one that's gonna you know have a higher conversion rate and then maybe spend a couple hours a day dabbling in Maybe it's your door knocking or your new Facebook thing you're doing, or yeah. now it's all this AI stuff, right? Like, cause everybody's always looking for that edge with the, you know, the technology and stuff. So, I mean, did you kind of go along those lines where you spoke a lot about the higher conversion? Because I mean, there's only so much time in a day, right? That's right. And, and what's interesting. So I, I just had this conversation uh, at the end of yesterday with one of our instructional designers. These are the people who, who write training. Um, she's working on a, a program for EXP for uh, new and unproductive agents. And, and this, uh, what she's doing, it, it, I have her going out and interviewing all these folks um, we have a list of hundreds of agents who did at least two deals in their first six months. And I think the cutoff, the minimum was at least 12 deals in their first year after licensing, by the way. Right. So first six months, two deals, first year, 12 deals minimum. And to a T, all these all these folks say exactly what you're saying is find that thing that you can focus on that's going to bring that that higher conversion business, but also to spend time experimenting. And, and Google famously had, I, I don't want to lie to you, I think it was um, 15% as a sort of ethos that you spent 15% of your time playing, figuring out something new, right? Mm -hmm. uh, innovating in your business. And, and I think that's a, a great way of, of doing it is making sure that that you're um, continuing to further and innovate in your business. <clears throat> Here's the caveat, though. Think about like uh, Procter and Gamble. Right. So, you know, they're doing great in diapers uh, and now they want to go get in a toothpaste. Well, they don't stop diapers. 
<laughs> that's that's the thing. You got to figure out a way to automate as much as possible to buy yourself the time and the leverage to go out and, and you know tackle toothpaste or dental gloss or whatever it is you want to do next in your business. Yeah. Um, so figuring out how you balance those out because that's that's often what happens. I, I had a really good friend of mine up in McKinney, Texas. Um, this uh, husband and wife team that were just crushing it. And they had gotten really successful by doing this ugly, I think it was like lime green, uh, just listed, just sold postcard. It wasn't even a card. It was like paper stock. It was the worst, but they just were so consistent with it for so long that they were dominant in their market. And then what did they do? They stopped sending it. They got bored with it. They thought, well, you know, we, we're, we're good. We'll try some other things. And they stopped sending it. You know what happened to their business? Down in the right. toilet. Oh. Um, and, and until they started resending that. And another friend in Virginia, Robert, he was crushing it with the Internet, so much so that he stopped doing everything else. And this was back in the day. Google did this algorithm change, wiped him off the first page. All of a sudden, all his business was done. He had to go figure out how to restart doing open houses and all the other traditional things while he tried to get back up on the first page of Google. Um, so, so have that balance just in case one lead generation source ever dries up on you. You've got that, that fallback as well. Yeah, we uh, talk about not putting all your eggs in one basket. Sorry, go ahead, Michael. No, no. And yeah, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. And I think the other thing that I found really fascinating and I would agree with is, well, one, I think you and I can geek out on spreadsheets, Brian. Um, I, <laughs> oh, I, I, I would love that. Um, but I, I think the other thing is like, it's just, you talk about like, you know, we have all these spreadsheets to say, okay, this is my annual goal. You break that down to a, to a problem that you can solve, like that you can tackle on a weekly basis hmm. and it's formulaic to your point and you can put in different percentages. But what's really important about that though, is you really have to be tracking that. And I really like kind of your approach, even now how you're developing these new courses with EXP is you're having your team go out there and gather that data. Mm. And I think that's another really important thing for, for agents is, yeah, you have, you, you try all these things, you commit yourself to certain things, you find that balance. But if you're not tracking how you're performing over time, like you're never going to really know like what's effective and what brought you over. That's right. That's very well said. You know, and it's funny, we, we build that into training. I, I build that into training. Um, and, and two things about what you're saying is, you know, I've been in this business for, for a little bit and I've, I've written a few training programs and I can probably from memory create a, a fairly decent new agent training program. So why, why go through the hassle of doing that research? Well, um, because what you want is the most relevant people in, in the, the context of today who are doing that thing. And, and by the way, that's a discipline I follow. Um, you know, you talk about the treadmill, the treadmill I follow. Uh, is the discipline of going out and finding people who are succeeding at that and and not just one or two, but a lot of them and then figuring out what's the commonalities? What are they doing? And, and then for the divergences, why do they do those things? Why do they diverge mm -hmm. from the from the pathway? Because that's very instructive in terms of helping people understand the step by step. You know, I, I jokingly refer to this as the mall map with with my trainers and writers. All right. You are here. You want to get there. All right. Let's go. Here's yeah. a, there's a defined pathway. And <clears throat> and when you can create that kind of thing, what what then you want to do is then provide some sort of accountability. There's a difference between education and training. Right. Um, if you go to a to a personal trainer at a gym. They don't walk you up to a bench press and go, Michael, Shane, this is the bench press. It was invented in 1872. The theory behind it, right? they, they put you on it. They make you start doing reps and they tell you yeah. elbows in, arch your back, all those kinds of things. And yeah. and so the, the other thing that they're going to do is they're going to do two things. They're going to ask you to track your activities, exercises, reps, weights. And they're also going to ask you to track your caloric deficit. Right. That is the discipline yeah. of getting into shape in our business. There is a discipline to, to getting into shape. Right. So if you're not tracking that, it's interesting. You walk into most brokerage offices, they're going to have a tracking mechanism, some sort of whiteboard back in the back room. Right. But it's going to be those lag measures, those those results, the closing. Right. Results, yeah. 
what you're not going to see when you walk in there is, hey, uh, Michael did uh, five contacts a day for the last 10 days straight, and he's got five appointments this week and two appointments, right? They're not going to track those those lead measures that are going to lead yeah, you. Well, it's not as glorious, right? It, it's, it's, it's not as glorious. Crazy. But if you want to see progress, focus on those activities. And if you can do that, if you can hold yourself accountable to those activities, the results are going to come. They really are. I, I, I um, jokingly refer to this as the sleep number. And uh, I shared this with somebody the other day. Um, I have a friend, Tim, who uh, at the time, um, he was 24 and he'd done like two and a half million in GCI in like two years into the business. And I said, how did you do that? And, and he said, 30 contacts a day. And he was right. I, I was in the same office as he was. He was right. He did 30 contacts a day and he didn't leave the office until he did. I saw him at the office late at night making those contacts sometimes. And, um, and I compared and contrast that with my mom. And I was sharing this with, with a group the other day. My, I'm dating myself. My parents used to uh, VCR Wheel of Fortune uh, in, in Jeopardy. And uh, every night, you know, as a family, we would watch Jeopardy and, and other game shows. And it seemed like almost every other night we got interrupted by the phone ringing and mom had to pause it. And it didn't matter what time of night it was. She was like immediately jump up at attention because she didn't know when to turn it off. And, you know, the thing that and I refer to it as the sleep number, when you dial back your, your desired goal to the activity level and you understand, OK, I got to make 30 contacts or whatever it is for you, even when you don't have a closing that day or the next day or even scheduled for that week, as long as you're doing the activities that, you know, are going to lead to results, as long as you've done that activity at the level, you know, you need to have done it. Stop. Put your phone down. Go hug your family. Go high five your friends. Go have a good life, um, because the results will come. And and then it, from then on out, it's just a matter of skills and tweaking and professionalism and getting better at your craft. That's interesting because what you just said about continuing to do those activities without seeing results right away, right? Because the instant gratification thing, especially with newer agents, yeah. We've actually been trained this as well. In fact, Michael and I have spoken even to our group about it is keep doing those activities, even when you're not getting the results because they'll come. That's really key. Something I can learn from what you're saying, though, and I'm actually getting better at this. My phone goes on Do Not Disturb at 830 and it's on Do Not Disturb till 830. So I get 12 hours phones like don't bother me. I mean, I'll check if there's something urgent going on, but but I like that discipline of cutting it off. By the way. You're not dating yourself because, uh, yeah, Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, those were our jam. Every night, dinner time, right? After dinner time. And, you know, it's it's sad that, you know, um, what's his name passed away from Jeopardy a couple years Alex ago. Alex Trebek. Yeah. 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 I love that. And then um, and Pat Sajak, right? Wheel of Fortune. And, He's still going. I, and, I actually saw that. I was at an airport <laughs> and I saw a B- B- and Vanna White's still doing it. Holy cow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's funny, but now we, we're from the same generation, I'm sure. Um, but uh, sorry, let me pass the mic back to our young engineer. <laughs> Not that young. I, I was also watching Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, and I know what a VCR is. So. <laughs> I guess I just have the Asian gene, so I look younger than I actually am. <clears throat> I'll take that for a win. Um, I, I think there's one other, one, one other comment I want to make, Brian, before I kind of move on to the next question is just, you know, it's interesting when you talk about like breaking it down, like your friend that had the 30 clients a day. Mm. Um, I find it really interesting. Like when you break the problem down to, to that daily level, like 30, when you think about it, it's, it, it's a stretch, it's a challenge, but it's, it's manageable versus like, if you're thinking about like, Oh, I have to do like 25 million in GCI for a year. Like, how am I going to do that? And yeah. then once you break down the problem, I, one thing I found that's been applicable to me is like, okay, 30, it forces me to think about, it forces me to kind of get creative too, mm. because it's like, okay, 30, I have to tackle 30 in a day. Like if I've already tapped into my sphere, okay, what are other avenues I can go about getting that 30 uh, because I want to be consistent about it. And you kind of mentioned like you've, you've had people in the past that go to Barnes and Noble, they, they, you know, they go on YouTube, whatever it is. And I think that's a really cool idea. Like when you break the problem down into like the detailed components, 
it's it's something more tangible for you to be able to focus on and when you can focus on something more tangibly i feel like your mind actually the mind actually will expand naturally mm-hmm. and it'll force you to like think about more creative solutions if you feel like you've already like the things that are already you're already working towards you've already kind of tapped out so to speak you know it's in in perfect time of year for this um for this conversation too <clears throat> is uh you know, I've often thought um, the day I want to be a gym owner is January 2nd. The day I don't want to be a gym owner is January 3rd. And and the reason for that is that most people just come in with this huge goal. And, and you talked about, Shane, that immediate gratification because they don't see it right away. They just lose hope. And uh, in coaching, there's this concept of, of incremental improvement, right? And if you're coaching me and, and my goal is 10 widgets a day or, or 30 phone calls a day, right? If I, if I come in, though, my goal is 10 widgets a day and, and I've done seven widgets, am I a good person? Am I a bad person? And the answer is it really depends. Um, mm-hmm. If I was doing six on average last week and five on average the week before, and I'm doing seven this week. High five. The question is not, you know, okay, well, 10 the goal. So how are you going to get to 10 next week? The question for me as a coach would be, okay, so you're at seven. So we know you can do that. What would it take to do eight? What would have to change for you to do eight? Right? Literally, what would have to change in your, in your work, in your calendar, in your sequencing, in what you do on a day-to-day basis? What would need to change for you to just to do eight. Don't worry about 10. If you can get to eight, then you can get to nine, then you can get to 10. And when I, um, I've, I've trained and coached a lot of uh, recruiters, uh, recruiting managers, um, brokers, you wanna talk about something that can be really discouraging from time to time, try being a professional recruiter, right? And so when I get people into, into the habit of, of, of uh, recruiting, it's just like going to a gym. Nobody goes into a gym and starts bench pressing 200 pounds right off the bat. So when I get people to start doing it, I say, you know, and you can do it a couple of different ways, but a, a classical one that I'll do is, okay, just start with one phone call per day. Just one phone call per day. Do that for a week. Just one recruiting, a, a meaningful contact, not just a call, a meaningful contact mm-hmm. to start with one per day. Get into that habit. Um, and, and I had a great uh, quote from a friend of mine. And, and what he said was, um, far fewer people fail to start a marathon than fail to finish. And once you get into that habit, um, ramping up, it, what you're going to find is by day five, you're like, OK, one phone call a day, one contact a day. is It, it feels like you are you've got a governor on you and you just want to go faster. But then ramp yeah. up, go two, go three, go four, and add two. And, and over a few weeks, what you're going to find is you get to 10 contacts per day pretty easily. And, and to your point, Michael, how you make those contacts, how you find those people, that'll work itself out because you'll, you'll have given yourself that sort of immersive experience where now you know the right questions to ask, right? You know, it's with this whole thing that we're talking about right now, it's interesting because it reminds me of, you know, because I always wanted the results now. Right. And for me to kind of slow it down, I started having to read some of these books that taught me about the like these incremental differences make a big difference in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to hit a home run today. And so I started reading books like Chop Wood, Carry Water, Pound the Stone, The Compound Effect, like all these types of books really slowed me down and it was like, look, just do a little bit each day, you know, just like what you're saying, right? And build it up and you'll get the result. The thing is, is like the reason a lot of people get frustrated is because we go in wanting it all today. And when it's not happening, we lose interest, right? But it's attainable to do just a little bit. You know, it's like even with the exercise, when I had to get back, because I love exercise, I love working out. But when I was recovering from the surgery, like I had pretty much depleted muscle and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't you know, because of the surgery, I couldn't do anything for like three or four months. And starting from ground zero after being athletic and active my whole life was so frustrating. And it took a lot of remembering and patience to remember, like, just do a little bit, just even if it's 10 minutes on the treadmill, even if it's like 
lifting five pound weights, which I didn't even know I had to go find. But uh, it just, uh, I've learned that, you know, just a little bit. So I, I love that whole concept mm-hmm. because that's how you get someone built up. Because like what you're saying, if you're going to go in and it'd be expected to do 200 pounds, you know, the first day, um, that's going to discourage a lot of folks. And uh, yeah, I just, I love hearing that. It's just, a, it's a reminder of what I had to practice because I was guilty of wanting it all the first day. Yeah. There's a great book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And in the opening of the book, he talks about, I think it was a British cycling team. And they had this concept of 1% improvement, right? Just get 1% better. And they did all these crazy things like, you know, um, sleeping in like heated beds and, and like just weird things. Go read the book. It's, it's funny, actually, the things that they did. And yet over the, the span of just a few years, that cycling team became the most dominant cycling team in history year after year after year. And he had this great quote, um, which was, uh, walk slowly forward, but never backward. Walk slowly forward, but never backward, right? And and I think you're right. I'm I'm betting now, Shane, looking at you, if you walked into a gym and lifted a five pound weight, it would feel weird for you now, right? Um, So what's embarrassing, right? Because to a certain extent, you feel like people are watching you, even though they're not. It's, I had a hard time doing that. I have my own gym at home, but when I was going to the gym, that actually makes me insecure. Were you going in that direction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, no, I, I'm just saying um, you, you look like you could lift substantially more than five pounds now. Back then, maybe it was oh, a yeah. struggle for you, but you graduated. And, and my point being is um, give yourself a little bit of grace to get into the habit of things and build up towards where you need to be. And when you get to 10 contacts a day, 30 contacts a day or whatever, doing one a day would feel weird because that's your identity, right? For you, your identity was, I I can lift a lot of weights and it felt weird for you to be not in your identity anymore. Um, So build that identity over, over time. You know, it's, but what's interesting and that's great advice and, and that's up here. But you're also saying that to like a like super alpha, like top producer, like like not complacent to any means Mm -hmm. giving grace. I've had to learn that over the last couple of years. I never had to learn that. And I hear that. I hear that from my doctor, coach, family. God, my mom, for God's sakes. Like, do you know what you've been through? And it's like it uh, you don't hear that when you've been because think about it, like when you've been a top producer and been engaged at such a high level for so long, you're lost. You're lost going back to, you know what I mean? It's so I, it's really good advice. And and I do totally, it resonates with me because I, I just experienced this over the last year and a half. In fact, I'm still building my way back. You know, I'm still not where I was, you know, and it's giving grace and being patient is really challenging for me sometimes when it comes to this kind of thing. Well, and and it's important too. When I say giving grace, what I don't mean is give yourself excuses, right? What I, what I mean is allow yourself to build to the level you need to. That's what I mean by grace, right? Again, walking slowly forward, but forward, just never backwards. And it's certainly never standing still. So yeah, I, I think that that is a most top performers become top performers because there's something in them that that drives them. And, um, and they set higher standards for themselves than anybody else would ever set. And when they don't meet those standards, they can get in their head. And the expression is when you're in your head, you're dead. They can get in their head and that really screws a lot more things up than just that time frame to go. Yeah, no, totally agreed. Yeah. When the thing too, is that, um, you know, people around you, like, you know, when you're like, an, oh, you're an icon agent or you're, oh, you're doing great. And and what the thing is, is that what they don't understand is that top for top performers have like their own goal or their own level of success. And just because you might be crushing most of the agents around you in production, it doesn't mean that you're there. It doesn't mean you're being your best self. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're doing your best work. And that that's you got to never be complacent because of your surroundings. Because the competition is with yourself, not with, you know, your colleagues or other brokerages or whatever. And um, and I think that's something that, you know, where I find some conflict sometimes is is there. Like, just try not to be arrogant, right? But understanding that 
you have your own path, your own journey, your own level of what you want to accomplish. Yeah. And by the way, um, on the topic of comparison, uh, comparing, you know, the comparison is a killer of joy, but also to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Um, because you know, those, those top, top producers that you see doing, you know, hundreds, thousands of transactions a year, I, I would caution you to judge yourself against them because I've seen a lot of their P and L's and there's a lot more L than P on those P and L's. Um, so, you know, just cause they're doing a lot of production doesn't mean they have a solid business. Um, so, so careful who you compare yourself to. And, and if you are going to compare yourself to somebody, make sure you're truly comparing what, um, what really matters, which is not necessarily unit count, but what, what then you get from that unit count. Yeah, no, and I, and I love yeah. that. I think part of that is like sometimes the, the shiny object that you see may not be so shiny, right, <laughs> underneath. Yeah. And I think also just like, I mean, to compare apples to apples, like where, like if you're a newer agent, where you are today, like, and somebody who's a top producer that's been in the business for 20 years, like, yeah, you're not where they're at, like, but that's could be an aspiration for you to work towards, right? But it doesn't make sense for you to compare yourself with them at this point in your career. Um, and then the other thing I want to hit on, Brian, is like earlier you mentioned, like, yeah, we're driven every day. We're, we're working, you know, working hard every day towards our goals. But then at some point you also have to, you know, turn off the phone, um, take time, focus on life, find that balance. Right. Obviously, you're somebody that has a lot going on, trying to balance the demands of your work with personal life, with family. So I guess a, a two part question um, one is like, you know, what are some principles you live and breathe every day that's helped you get to where you are today? Mm. And what are you looking forward to kind of the most for yourself in this next year? Yeah, there's a, um, a great book I, um, and an exercise uh, called 168 hours. And um, that's how many hours we have in a week. Um, yeah. and, and by the way, within that is sleep. You know, 56 of that is what doctors say should be taken up, um, showering, eating, all that stuff. Um, and, and when I think about my 168 hours, starting with the things that I want to accomplish in my life, I, I have four uh, amazing kids, I have an amazing wife. Um, and, and, you know, we were lied to our whole entire life. We were, we were told that love is spelled L O V E. Well, it's not, it's spelled T I M E. And if you want to be a better father, if you want to be a better spouse or partner, significant other, um, that means time. You want to be uh, more spiritual. That means time. You want to be more involved in community and politics or whatever it is that you want to do. That means time. And um, there's this interesting concept of Parkinson's law. Uh, um, work will expand. Mm -hmm. and, and what I like to do is kind of figure out my time first, my, my time, my family time, my, my, um, I have hobbies I like to do. I have things I want to accomplish outside of work. I want to figure that out first. What's left over. I'm going to use that time purposefully. And uh, to a certain degree, I, I, I'm, uh, I think I'm a kind, generous person, but I'm pretty belligerent about my time. Um, and you know, I, I, I joke with agents, not really joke, but, um, Never, ever again in your lifetime ask the question, what time is good for you? Um, that is a really bad question for controlling your time. Um, a better question is, would this time or that time work? And if neither one of those times work, okay, great. How about this time or this time? In other words, you dictate when you meet with a client. That's a very scary thing for a lot of agents, by the way. Um, because they think that they're going to suggest a time and that buyer or that seller is going to go, you're a jerk, never mind, and hang up the phone. That's not what happens, by the way. Um, yeah. But that, that's that kind of concept. And so for me, the, the principles is, for me is controlling my time. I, I, if I can't control my time, I'm not going to be able to do the things that I want in life. And, and I, my uh, second son, Oliver, is a big soccer player. I take him to his practices and I take him to his games, right? My daughters are competi uh, competition dancers. I want to be at those competitions. I want to see them dance. I want to be able to take them to, to practices each night. Um, and, and I want to have date night with my wife uh, at least once a week and have fun, you know? 
that all takes time. And so for me, the principle I live by is, is just that. If I can control my time, I'll be able to achieve. No, I, lo- I love that idea. And that, <laughs> that's something I've had to learn over the last like three, four years is, you know, in my head, I imagine like it, we're like we have like a reservoir. And I think like putting your yourself, your time for yourself first allows you to fill up that reservoir with, within yourself. Right. And only through that can then you actually give to other people, whether it's your clients that you're serving or, you know, your friends or your family. Um, and so I love that you kind of prioritize. Yeah. Yeah. That's a challenge for me. So I guess Michael with the engineering personality and then Brian, I guess you almost have like an engineering background since you guys. You know. No, it's a challenge for me too, by the way. I mean, you know, when, when uh, Mr. Sanford calls, I need to, I need to be there for him when, when Leo or Michael need something, I need to be there for him. So it's, it's constantly a challenge and it's, um, I don't mean to sound perfect. I believe you me, I am not in any way. Oh no, not at all. But I'm just, I, I, that concept though has been hitting hard lately because it's been impacting. Um, cause I'm one of the people that, you know, I put everybody else and everything else before myself, you know, and obviously having health issues and everything else, it's like, you know, you want to be alive before you can even think about having time. And so, you know, prioritizing yourself. I mean, for the sake of family and, and what you said, I totally agree. And my daughter's 17 now, but, you know, I did good about racing back and getting to those games and doing what I could. But I mean, there's still regret, you know, of not because of like what you said, right? Like I was so paranoid I wasn't going to be available. I tried to always be available when clients call. Hmm. Right. I remember with some of these Silicon Valley, like, big time CEOs or big time, you know, people in the technology. I remember taking calls at midnight or one in the morning because that's when they were available. Like, you know, those long summer days, you know, they they were looking to buy something down here or whatever and or whatever we were doing. I remember, you know, taking calls and I didn't drive my schedule. Clients drove my schedule because I was one of those fearful agents that was going to lose out. So so I respect that you're able to lay that down and then just be confident. And at the end of the day, like, you know, the people that are meant to work with you, they're going to be your clients. They're going to align with you. They're going to value and respect. Like I have clients now. Oh, no, no. You know, it's still here. Go enjoy your family or no, it's dinner time. Or, hey, don't worry about this today. You know, when you have some time, like those are the kind of clients I have now. And I appreciate the fact that that's really reinforced what you're saying. Like they're just going to be like, oh, yeah, I don't want to work with you now. Yeah. They're going to see you as even more of a professional. And then, you know, a lot of people do have strong family values. And so if they see that oh, look, he's going to be there for his daughter. It's going to make them like you more. You know, it's like, you know, this guy's, you know, like us, you know, it's like, oh, wait, you're going to, you're going to church on Sunday morning. Totally cool. Like, you know what I mean? So I think that, I think that helps you align with, with who you're supposed to align with at the end of the day. And it's all interrelated with what we just said. Um, Because do you know who doesn't fear that conversation? Is an agent who has another listing appointment or, uh, you know, a, a full pipeline of buyers um, aside from the person they're talking to. The people who fear that conversation are the people who are in that scarcity of not having enough business. And, and that goes back to what we talked about earlier, that that treadmill, that discipline of making sure that you fill your pipeline. And, and it, in those very rare circumstances, and it is very rare, where you have to meet with a client at a particular time or else then you get to make the decision whether or not that client's right for you or you refer it out for 30%. You know, that's your choice. No, totally, totally agree. Well, I know, Michael, uh, we need to wrap up. We're having such a great conversation. I know, but, it's, uh, it's always fun to go. have these. And it just goes and goes, which is awesome. Well, Brian, we have one question we always like to um, ask our, our podcast guests. Um, Shane, do you want to do the honors this time? <laughs> well, sure. I mean, basically, you know, Brian, what we like to ask everyone, even when they're not in the real estate industry, is that, you know, if you were going to start your own real estate business today, you know, what like, you know, kind of short version, like what what step or what plan, you know, how would you attack being a new real estate agent today in today's market? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So you're talking to somebody who went door to door uh, from the age of 14 to the age of 20. Um, So for me, there is no faster way to get into a relationship with somebody than than door knocking, uh, cold calling and prospecting. 
Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. But but if I were getting into the business, by the way, I've been with a, a few different real estate companies. The top agents in those companies all were door knockers. Isn't that interesting? Um, but wow. yeah. Um, so for one, uh, I would focus on a farm and I would focus on dominating the things in that farm. And I would do that personally by door knocking. And I would be doing it around open houses, just listed, just sold. Whether or not those were my open houses, just listed, just sold, do not matter. Um, but bringing value to those doors that I knocked by offering them the valuation of their home. Um, building a community in that farm. Again, I talked earlier about um, about uh, the sort of synergy of your legion sources. So in that, in that farm, so I'll give you an example. I have a friend of mine. Um, what she does uh, a couple times a year is she goes to a grocery store and she gets them to donate their paper bags to her. She staples her flyer to those paper bags. She goes around her farm, drops them off, lets them know I'll be back in a week to pick this up. And, and you know, we're donating to the local food bank. Oh, by the way, has anybody talked to you about the equity in your home and how to take advantage of this amazing market that we're in? Um, be back in a week. Comes back in a week. Knock, knock, knock. Here for the groceries. Oh, cool. And oh, by the way, and then um, can I get your contact information? I'll let you know how much we raised for this local area food bank. Calls them up. Hey, by the way, we you know raised 18 tons of food. And oh, by the way, right? three touches in, in short fashion. Um, and then I'd own that neighborhood on social. Go take a, a Facebook. I live in, in Austin, Texas, where we have a lot of master plan communities, right? Go take a Facebook page out. Um, with a picture of the entryway of that uh, community. And, you know, you may have a homeowner association, doesn't matter. And then go get that neighborhood through a reverse lookup. Go get that neighborhood's uh, contact information such as you can create your Facebook uh, group for it, a boost group. And then go boost your ads as you put out the valuations of the home and also whatever homes have sold in that neighborhood. Um, whatever information you can share about the home sales in that neighborhood, boost that to that group. And then uh, finally, I would just dominate the expireds and fizzbills. Again, I, I have no problem with angry people, so expireds don't scare me. Um, and fizzbills, you know, you can take the traditional approach of, hey, you know, if I had a buyer, would you? Um, or you can you can take a non-traditional approach, which is sort of straightforward is, hey, I get it. You want to sell your home on your own. Cool. If I can help you on the buy side of your next purchase, I'd be more than happy to give you as much uh, information and help as I can on the listing side without being your listing agent. By the way, what's going to happen when you get into a relationship with them on the buy side of things, they're going to realize quickly how um, how difficult our job is. And since you're already in a relationship, you stand a much better chance of gaining their listing. Um, those are just a few of the things that I would do, but I, I would really focus on a geographic farm and focus on the listings. That's great advice, Brian. It's, and I love what you said about like the master plan communities and doing the Facebook group and everything. What I do with my geo farm is I was able to get my hands on the HOA roster. Yeah. So um, I got, I was able to level up on that. And um, that's one of the only places I've ever felt comfortable walking around. Everybody knows me when I'm down there and I don't go down there enough to last year or so but um whenever i'm down there I'll, I'll be in conversations i pretty much to almost everybody just unfortunately that's not a community that has a lot of turnover mm. but when there is turnover i mean you're talking about you know between three and eight million so good price point at least that's so, not bad that's not bad at all yeah yeah well because you know depending on where you're at right like a master plan community and you know in your market prices have gone way up it's expensive but it's like i know in texas a lot of my agents i work with in texas you know, they'll sell 150 homes a year, you know, I'll sell 30 to 40 homes here, which is good. So it's just a different concept, yeah, yeah. but, um, but yeah, anyway, we could go on all day, but no, I, that's great advice, Brian. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I'm imagining new agents these days, you know, the got milk slogan before now it should be, Oh, by the way, I love that. It's a great way to like connect to a different topic. Um, Brian, I mean, Thank you so much for your time. Um, we really appreciate having you on. You're just a, a wealth of knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. wisdom, just lessons learned. And we appreciate you so much for kind of sharing that with us and also with our audience. Um, 
if folks wanted to connect with you, like, is there a good way for them to be able to do that? Yeah. Um, for our EXP folks listening, uh, I'm on Workplace. Just make sure you go to my uh, my chief learning officer account, not my agent account. Um, and, and when you look me up, you'll see the difference. It's pretty clear. Uh, and for non-EXP agents, uh, Ellington at exprealty.net. Um, I, I'm always open for uh, great conversations, great ideas. So hit me up. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Top Producing Zone podcast. We'll catch you again on next week's episode. Thank you. See you soon.